Thanks uh, again for the invitation to be here. It's, um, in many ways, we've tried to model um, our NAI or tried to, to, to um, take, take lesson, obviously, from VPL, which I think has been um, one of the, obviously, one of the most successful endeavors in, in astrobiology. So it's, um, it's great to actually come out here. This is my first time on, on campus and, and meet the people that uh, um, have been driving astrobiology in, in many ways for, for many years, or the type of astrobiology that I'm most interested in, I should say. Um, yeah, so today uh, I'm going to talk about reverse weathering. Um, I've given a purposefully vague title because it's, it's something that a lot of people may not be that familiar with. Um, but before I talk to it, I wanted to start um, by just thanking the two students that have done all of the hard work for this talk. Um, so Terry Ithan is a PhD student that's just finishing up, and Boriana calderon Asiel is a second year PhD student. Um, and the talk will have really two portions both of which were really driven by, by these two really fantastic PhD students. So if there's aspects of the talks that you like, you can assume it's because of them. And there's aspects where it seems like I've lost the thread. You can blame that on, on me, of course. So yeah, my research group and I, in general, am interested in tracking how Earth's atmosphere has changed through time. The three gases I'm most interested in are atmospheric oxygen, which is where I've spent actually most of my, my research time so far where a lot of my group works on. Um, more interestingly, I've, more recently, I've gotten interested in methane. Uh, methane is one that I think uh, obviously plays a critical role in a critical role in controlling Earth's climate, and is one that we know very little about, which makes it appealing. One of the problems um, with methane is that it's very difficult to to have empirical records or to track how methane has changed through time. Carbon dioxide, in contrast, is one that is, is one where it plays a key role in controlling climates. We have very poor understanding of how it has changed through time, what processes are controlling its change. And we can tie all of our observations on how carbon dioxide has changed and the processes controlling carbon dioxide to the rock record as well. Um, so I already kind of alluded to this, but um, I think the, the reasons for being interested in carbon dioxide are obvious. Through Earth's history, it's, it's undeniable that just as in the future as we increase carbon dioxide levels, we'll have warming, that carbon dioxide levels have, um, for instance, through the Cenozoic, played a key role in regulating the mean Earth state. Similarly, when we think about this in terms of, of a, a suite of terrestrial exoplanets, carbon dioxide levels or the greenhouse, which will, will play kind of a master role in controlling the greenhouse gases of that planet, specifically water vapor on that planet, will play a key role in controlling the climate state. And one of the other things that that's, I think is, is most interesting about this is that even though the way we often think about it is that, that greenhouse gases control climate, um, or they control whether a planet is habitable, but greenhouse gases at the same time are, of course, strongly influenced or shaped by the life on that planet. It's, um, it's a case where if you think about what is, what is a, a, the questions that are most interesting to you, questions that are most interesting to me are things where we can um, be able to understand the coevolution of, of tectonic processes, of planetary scale processes, and of um, biological processes. So in terms of specific questions that got me interested in thinking about carbon dioxide levels, one of the things uh, that, that got me foremost interested in this is, is what is referred to as the faint young sun paradox. So who's everybody in this room feel like, this would be a place where I, I don't have to ask this question, but as a raise of hands, who's heard of the faint young sun paradox? Yeah, see, that's great. Usually you go to universities and you can't get a, you know, there's no love for the Archean. It's great to hear that there is, there's a love for the Archean, there's a love for, you know, astrobiology, the only two questions. So uh, this slide really doesn't need much introduction. This is an idea that it wasn't come up, wasn't, um, of course, uh, formulated by, that was championed foremost by Carl Sagan. And the, the simple way I like to phrase this is that even though we have a pretty poor understanding of how temperature has changed through its history, it seems like temperature has been relatively constant or even cooled as the sun has become more luminous. So that means that something was fundamentally different about the climate state for large portions of Earth's history as the sun was slowly increasing in luminosity. Right? Um, people may phrase this paradox in other ways, but I think to me that's the, the, the what is the paradox of it is, is really just that something was fundamentally different about 
how climate was regulated, how the Earth worked for the majority of Earth's history relative to today. Okay, so if that's the question we want to ask, a good place to start is thinking of what's the most basic way and what is the most um, succinct way of formulating how climate on Earth is regulated? What is the most, f what process is the most, or is generally agreed upon to be the most fundamental in controlling Earth's climate? And I think almost everybody would agree that it's the, the Urey reaction, um, where that's removal of carbon dioxide through interaction with a silicate mineral um, to precipitate calcium carbonate in a chert phase controls the amount of carbon dioxide that accumulates in Earth's atmosphere on long time scales. So for instance, in Earth, right, a large portion, the majority, the vast majority of carbon is present as carbonate minerals instead of, like in Venus, being accumulated in the atmosphere in the ocean, or well, no ocean in that case, but <laughs> in the fluid, in the fluid system. Okay? Um, so what makes this an actual feedback is that some process must be re regulating this removal to ensure that the planet doesn't spin out of control into an extremely cold or an extremely warm state. Um, this is one of my favorite figures. This is from my former colleague Bob Berner and Ken Caldera that made a very simple point. It's showing just if you have different amounts of imbalance between the carbon sourced to the ocean atmosphere system and the carbon removed, that on very short time scales geologically, you will spin out of control to either something where we're not habitable because we're too cold or we're, habitable, we're not habitable because of massive CO2 concentrations. Right? So this figure is often what is given as the strongest evidence that there must be some sort of silicate weathering feedback. There must be some means of regulating how rapidly carbon dioxide is removed. Um, the way Bob always used to, to phrase this would be, um, the, the strongest evidence that there's a silicate weathering feedback is that you're alive, um, meaning there must be perfect balance between carbon sources and sinks, or the Earth wouldn't be habitable. Right? So how does, this actually, how does this actually work? The simple idea of how this works is that the amount of carbon that comes into the system, which is the equal to the, um, which we can think of in many cases as being equal to the outputs, is going to be balanced at a given CO2 level by silicate weathering. And as we say increase, because of say increased volcanism, the amount of carbon dioxide coming into the system, we will move to a higher CO2 state where weathering rates will be more rapid where these two fluxes balance. Right? And that is the silicate weathering feedback. That is what most people would agree is the, the fundamental control on climate in the Earth system. And this weathering, importantly, can happen whether it's in marine systems or in continental systems. Okay. So what we're going to do, and what really the, the next 136 slides are about, <laughs> just kidding, <laughs> is trying to figure out some way in which we are not only regulating climate by this state. So does anybody have questions before we think about why this might be wrong. Does anybody have questions about the first couple slides? The paradigm in which we could say we're trying to question. OK. Um, so what we're going to explore is instead of thinking about the Urey reaction, instead of thinking about a silicate weathering feedback, what we're going to talk about is a world in which you have extensive reverse silicate weathering which is often just referred to as reverse weathering. Um, so as another, another show of hands, who's actually heard of, of reverse weathering before, besides my talk title? <laughs> Doesn't count, OK? Not, not bad. There was two people at least, <laughs> three people. I've had zero people, which um, you know, is, uh, is worse. Um, <clears throat> OK, so good. What is reverse weathering? Reverse weathering is basically where instead of precipitating a silicate and a carbonate phase only, you're precipitating a clay mineral within the ocean atmosphere system. Right? So you, you can think of it as taking a silicate mineral, breaking that down, either in the marine realm or the continental realm, and then reforming from the marine realm another silicate mineral. And what this does is it retains carbon within the ocean atmosphere system, 
So in effect, we can think of this process as basically a net source of CO2. Um, so it's not acting, it's not necessarily in opposition to the urea reaction. This is an alternative pathway, but this is something that takes place as well as the canonical urea reaction. Okay, so what does this actually look like in terms of real reactions, right? That often helps um, to ground things. The simplest way to think about this would be just dissolve constituents combining. So you could take dissolved silica and iron, for instance, consuming alkalinity, producing the mineral grenolite and CO2. Right? That's the simplest way of thinking about this. But there is, importantly, a, um, a whole range of clay minerals that can be formed. And most of these become things that are much more complex, for instance, like glauconite than grenolite. I, I promise you that's actually a balanced reaction. Actually, who knows? It's, it, could, <laughs> it could very well not be balanced. I'm not going to leave it on the slide long enough for you to check. Um, OK, so dissolved constituents can combine to form an authogenic clay in the marine realm. You can also have cation enrichment, which is often referred to as expansion of clays. The classic example of this is a smectite, which is a common weathering product forming glauconite. Um, right, where you have a detrital clay in form. And you can also have cation substitution for a framework silica or aluminum. This again involves a detrital clay. But importantly, in all of these, which encompass a huge number of reactions, importantly, all of these recycle CO2 within the ocean atmosphere system. So all of these, in effect, act as a CO2 source. And this is, is um, an example of, of grenolite. If you're wondering why I had a random green powder at the bottom of my slide. OK, so what happened to reverse weathering? Why are we not talking about reverse weathering? Reverse weathering actually, or as we meaning, why is this not something that is commonly incorporated into climate models? Um, reverse weathering for a while actually was in vogue. And many of the prominent scientists in the 60s were commonly talking about reverse weathering. Um, so for instance, Lars Sillen had a um, science paper outlining the importance of reverse weathering in the 60s and foremost, Bob Garrels, who is, you know, is, in the, is in the Hall of Fame of geochemists without question, um, for, through much of the 60s and early 70s, pushed the importance of reverse weathering. Um, this is one of my favorite papers where the abstract for this paper outlining the importance of reverse weathering is a single sentence. I think that's a sign, one of the signs, you know, brevity, brevity is greatness in writing often. Being able to convey an entire paper in a single sentence is something that, that I would, um, that I would, uh, would love to, love to be able to do. So what, what happened to reverse weathering? Why, if you had people like, like Bob Garrels arguing for its importance, did it fall out of favor? Does anybody want to take, take a guess of what happened to reverse weathering for it to fall out of fashion? So some context of, of where people are talking about as well is they were talking about it as a means to solve global mass balances, foremost magnesium. Right? This was proposed to be the largest magnesium sink in the 60s in the oceans. Okay. Does that give hints? We have a guess? What? Sorry, we had too many guesses. One, just one guess. Yeah, right? So all of a sudden, our magnesium problem just went away. We had a means to remove magnesium that didn't involve reverse weathering. And also, people kept going out into marine sediments and looking for reverse weathering, and they just couldn't find it. So it was a combination of basically reverse weathering became um, much less popular because hydrothermal systems are much cooler than thinking about clay formation in a sediment pile. And whenever we looked for it in the modern system, we didn't really find evidence for it. Okay. But that's just the modern Earth system, right? And Earth has changed dramatically through time. And one of the things that plays a fundamental role in controlling the formation of silicate minerals is dissolved silica concentrations. And the silica cycle has changed dramatically through its history. So right now, modern seawater is extremely depleted with respect to all chert phases, with respect to all silica phases. Um, and it's, <laughs> I, was, I was warned about this, and it is actually much, much of a, uh, more of a scolding alarm than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's good that it came in something that I feel that wasn't a very controversial point. If that would have come in like a controversial point, it would have, would have been much worse. So the fact that we have a biologically controlled modern silica cycle is not controversial, right? 
um, the, for the, I think the most, obvious um, the most obvious expression of this is that your average silicon atom is cycled something like 30 times in the oceans, is taken up in a diatom, dissolves in the, oops, sorry, <laughs> dissolves in the water column, and is recycled back something like 30 times before it's actually buried as a chert phase. And that's because of this extreme undersaturation that we have. Organisms are expending large amounts of energy to cause extreme undersaturation of silica phases in the ocean. And what this does is it means that clay phases are also undersaturated. So reverse weathering is sluggish and spatially limited today because we have extremely low <coughs> dissolved silicon concentrations. But all of these kids, radiolarian, siliceous sponges, and diatoms, have only been around for trivial portion of Earth's history, right? These are all organisms that evolved late in Earth's history. Foremost, diatoms have really only been key primary producers for like 20 million years, a trivial portion of Earth's history. So the question that I'm interested in, um, the question that we're interested in is, would high silica concentrations in a world without silica biomineralization have caused extensive reverse weathering? And the more interesting question maybe is, did the emergence of siliceous organisms, did the emergence of silica biomineralization result in a fundamentally different type of climate control? So as a first way of trying to answer this question, we can just think about saturation states. I already told you that there would be a large difference from modern, the saturation state of modern clay minerals in this silica poor world and in a Precambrian world where there were no silica biomineralization, where there was no silica biomineralization. These are a range of different clay phases, potential reverse weathering products. And in blue, we have the modern saturation state, saturation index, and in the warmer colors, we have two different estimates of the saturation state in the Precambrian, in Earth's early history. And what you'll notice for a lot of these, for instance, granolite, minnesotalite, berthering, there is strong supersaturation in the Precambrian and extreme undersaturation in the modern Earth system. Okay. So to be able to answer the second part of this question, at least there's, there's that. That's great. That at least suggests that silica biomineralization, that the radiation of eukaryotic organisms on our planet could have changed reverse weathering. But to really be able to answer if that plays a role in controlling climate, we need to think about a carbon cycle model. We need to think about a model that tracks reverse weathering's role on the carbonic acid system. So to do that, we've used um, the LOSCAR model, or the Long-Term Ocean Atmosphere Sediment Carbon Cycle Reservoir model, which for acronyms is not bad. Um, is only a little bit of a stretch to come up with the LOSCAR acronym. Um, this was made by Richard Zeeby, and it's been used foremost to, ex to explore carbon perturbations in the Cenozoic. For instance, it's been used extensively to explore the PTM and future climate, future climate change with our current carbon injection. Um, <clears throat> so it is a spatially resolved uh, model to some extent. It's a basically in a, a box model that does a very good job of keeping track of carbonate chemistry. Um, but it does have different ocean basins um, and a fair amount of, and some resolution within each of your different ocean basins. So A is meant to represent Atlantic, P is meant to represent Pacific. And it has benthic component, a sedimentary cycle, as well as ocean atmosphere exchange. Okay. But it is basically an elaborate box model that was designed to do carbonate chemistry well. We've modified this by including reverse weathering. Um, and one of the, the terms that you'll, you'll see me taught using um, quite a bit here is, is FR, FRW, or the, which is the fraction of silica that's sequestered through reverse weathering. So even though a whole bunch of cations are involved in reverse weathering, we've chosen to, t of, we've chosen to keep track of reverse weathering through silica, which is a critical component in all siliciclastic, all clay minerals. Right? Um, so that is FRW. Opal is just your chert phase. Um, and the, one of the other things that you'll um, see in the figures coming up here is an alkalinity to, to silica ratio. You can think of this number as basically just being the amount of carbon dioxide that is kicked out after forming a clay mineral. Um, and just as you notice, there was a whole bunch of diversity in the clay mineral phases. 
that we have, each of those has a different alkalinity to silica ratio. Each of those releases with a cation consumed a different amount of CO2. All right, so the first thing we did is basically once we put um, reverse weathering into this model, we just arbitrarily forced, Terry just arbitrarily forced different amounts of reverse weathering. What we're looking at here is atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations and the marine pH. And of course, these two are um, intimately coupled, um, intimately coupled uh, parameters. And what we're seeing in the contours here are these, these alkalinity to silica ratios that I just mentioned, different types of clay mineral assemblages. The blue line, for contrast, is an estimate from a GCM-based estimate of the levels of carbon dioxide that we would need to maintain an ice-free protozoic state, or a, a non-runaway um, glacial protozoic state, I should say. Um, <clears throat> and what you notice is that with relatively small amounts of reverse weathering introduced to the system, we can have large jumps in atmospheric carbon dioxide levels, right? And corresponding drops in the marine pH. However, that's just arbitrarily forcing an amount of reverse weathering. What we'd really like to be able to know is given the conditions that people predict for the Precambrian, given conditions that you could predict for the ocean on some other planet, how much would how much reverse weathering would that actually induce? And to get at that, we modified LOSCAR even further. Terry modified LOSCAR even further by putting a diagenetic model into LOSCAR. Um, the idea of using only a diagenetic model was that you're going to have higher degrees of supersaturation and no seed nucleation problem in poor waters. So, but it's a conservative approach to assume that this reverse weathering reaction is only happening in poor waters rather than in the water column. And diagenetic models can become as complicated as you want them to be. Um, but the basic aspects of a diagenetic model are very simple. You can just think of how the concentration of a given solute changes with depth in a pore water profile um, being a result of diffusion, advection in the system, which will, this will be controlled by the concentration gradient, this will be controlled by the sedimentation rate, and a series of reactions in that system. Okay? And what we found is that in modern systems, you have silica being sourced from pore waters up into the water column, where diatoms and radiolarians and silicious sponges are dissolving, being fluxed back into the water column. And in contrast, in the Precambrian, you are drawing down silica into pore waters because of formation of orthogenic clay minerals. So one of the things you may be thinking is that if you have diatoms and you have radiolarians falling into the sediment pile, why aren't sediment concentrations experiencing these very high silica concentrations? Um, and to get at that, uh, we made a compilation of all pore water measurements that have been made. This is actually, uh, the, um, the compilation was actually made by pa a colleague, Patrick Frings, at, um, who was working with Friedhelm von Blackenberg. Um, and what you notice from this is that this is, uh, you can think of it as kind of a probability, dens probability density map with depth and pore water silica concentrations is that there's basically no modern pore waters that fall in the range that we predict for the Precambrian. Right? So both Terry and I know how to adjust this color contour function in MATLAB. <laughs> this is specifically shown as a predominantly blue space to illustrate that in modern pore water systems, you don't have anything comparable to what is predicted for the Precambrian. All right, any questions about that so far? Um, you are dissolving, you're dissolving huge amounts of silica. It's just diffusing into the overlying water column. Yeah. Um, is the simplest explanation for it. Yeah. Great question. Okay, one of the other things we also noticed um, and that, that Terry, uh, when I say we, that Terry noticed is that there is a strong, a strong pH dependence on the rates of clay formation as well. And this makes sense, of course, from a thermodynamic point of view. Right? One of the products of reverse weathering is acidity. So of course, pH is going to determine the rates of this, of this reaction. But also, just in experimental settings, there's a strong dependence 
on the rates of clay mineral formation and pH. Um, so for instance, these are some uh, results that are, or this is a reaction rate constant term that is taken from experimental results from Nick Tosca. And what you notice is there's a huge change in this reaction rate constant term as you move from pH. At high pH, you have very rapid rates of reverse weathering. And at lower pH, you have, um, at lower pH, you have very sluggish rates of reverse weathering. And in fact, this is even a bit of a, um, a conservative approach for this. The, in these experimental results, you actually move to a system where on experimental time scale, scales, reverse weathering totally shuts off. So at a pH of 7, actually, this is the blue dot shown here, there's actually no reverse weathering shown. So there's one way to think about it is there's an infinitely strong <laughs> increase in reverse weathering as you move from a situation where there's no reverse weathering occurring, no clay formation in these experiment conditions occurring, up into very rapid rates of reverse weathering. Okay? And what this sets up, importantly, is a system where you'll have a stabilizing feedback. When you have higher pH, which you could think of as being driven by a decrease in volcanic outgassing rates, you'll have an increase in reverse weathering. That'll bump up atmospheric CO2, lower the pH, stabilizing that system. Right? This is a stabilizing feedback, importantly, that is independent of the canonical, the canonical silicate weathering feedback. So we can look at some curves to try to illustrate that point a bit more. This is a bit, of a bit of a tricky one. And for people that like to read, we've, instead of hearing me ramble, we've kind of outlined this basic idea in, in text as well. But the simple idea from this, um, we're looking now at outgassing and how the fraction of reverse weathering, or the fraction of silica removed through reverse weathering, the FRW term changes, how atmospheric CO2 changes, and marine pH changes. So at low outgassing rates, oh, so the last piece of information is the red curve is a world without reverse weathering, and the blue curves are a world with reverse weathering. Okay, so in world with reverse weathering and the, at different dissolved silicon concentrations, we have limited changes in PCO2 as we change outgassing dramatically. 7x here, for instance, is roughly what we've estimated based on the zircon record for Phanerozoic outgassing changes, which is a horribly imprecise estimate, but gives you some sort of rough estimate of how much we've changed outgassing here. Um, limited change in atmospheric CO2 and marine pH in strong contrast to the world without reverse weathering. And basically what you have happening is in this lower outgassing system, we just have higher amounts of reverse weathering, stabilizing the climate system. We're going to do this one more time, just in case folks aren't, folks aren't quite getting it yet. But this time we're going to do it with some wiggles. Um, so what we're looking at instead of this time is now model years. And we're looking at a sinusoidal forcing in outgassing rates. Just a single imaginary Precambrian state, a single dissolved silicon concentration. And again, limited changes in PCO2, limited changes in marine pH in strong contrast what we see in a world similar to the modern, where reverse weathering is not playing a key part of the global climate system. Okay? So as a last, um, a last bit for the modeling here, we can tie this to estimates of outgassing and tie it to various estimates shown here in, <coughs> shown in the light gray boxes of PCO2 reconstructions. And with reverse weathering turned on, it gives us a means to, without changing any other component of the carbonic acid system, for instance, without changing significantly how weathering occurs on land, a means to have very high PCO2 conditions. Okay. So what our model suggests is that reverse weathering could have played a substantial role in maintaining a warm, a habitable, a clement Precambrian state, and that Delicious organisms could have induced significant cooling, could have fundamentally changed the way we regulate climate on the Earth system. But the important part here is that really our model just suggests this, right? And I actually, I'm more of an isotope geochemist than a modeler. Um, so the, the next obvious question is, when you have a model that suggests something, you try to think of a means in which you can actually test 
those observations. So for the second part of the talk here, what we're going to do is try to bolster these claims with some actual, with some observations from the rock record. Okay. An obvious first place to start with this would be looking at, say, the directly looking at the rock record, looking at the composition of sedimentary rocks. Um, we're talking about having clay minerals forming in the oceans. We could imagine that there should be some record in shales of this process occurring. One of the problems with that, of course, is that all of the clays, essentially all the clays that I listed, for you can form in terrestrial settings or they can form in the marine realm. Right? Um, however, one of the products that is, is commonly invoked to have only formed in the marine realm is grenolite and minnesotalite, um, and also stilpnomaline, although stilpnomaline is commonly a metamorphic product. So what we've shown here is this is the orthogenic clay normalized occurrences, um, normalized to the area of rock present, um, looking at only the occurrences of grenolite and minnesotalite. And interestingly, what you see is there is a higher um, area normalized and just raw occurrence of these mineral phases in the Precambrian. Right? However, one of the things, of course, that you could say is that's only tracking a single mineral phase. And of course, there's lots of reasons to think that this would be biased and affected by what people have actually done XRD work on. But I think the important takeaway from this, and what comforted me about this figure, is at least it didn't go the other way. <laughs> the other way would have been very discouraging. And this is at least consistent with the predictions we've made. But of course, the real way you answer a question about how Earth has evolved is with an isotope system, not with mineralogical data. Um, so what we're going to use to try to answer this question is the lithium isotope system. So raise hands. Who's heard of lithium isotopes before? Some, not bad. Some um, was actually uh, some of the work that was done in this department or, um, had motivated me to get excited about um, the lithium isotope system. So lithium isotopes, the simplest way to think about lithium isotopes is that it is an isotope system that is controlled by clay formation. Okay. So river waters are isotopically heavy because of clay formation during continental weathering. Um, hydrothermal fluids also come in in a value that's slightly heavier than the continents, or than the um, crustal value. And the seawater value is much heavier than the crustal value because of a heavy source from rivers and clay formation in the marine realm. So we have clay formation in continents and clay formation in the marine realm giving us heavy lithium isotope values. Okay. So here's some actual data so you don't think I'm just making this stuff up. Um, this is a compilation put together by Mathieu Delinger. Um, and it's showing crustal rocks, shales, suspended sediments in rivers, which are light, relative to the dissolved load, which is the isotopic complement and contains these heavy values because of clay formation. Okay. So the simplest way to think about this, um, or what my original thought about how this system would work, would be that if we have more reverse weathering, we have more clay formation, we should just move to heavier lithium isotope values. Right? Um, who wants to take a guess? Why is that a horrible way of thinking about this, this problem? The simple answer, you only got one sink, right? You can't just increase the amount of lithium removal. All of your lithium is already being removed through reverse weathering. Okay? So the way to think about this system, or the way to have reverse weathering have an effect on this system is thinking about how the fractionation factor during lithium removal in the marine realm will change. Okay? And lithium is removed in the modern oceans today in two main ways. We have the majority of lithium being removed right now in, on, in, sorry, in off axis hydrothermal alteration during clay formation, um, during marine weathering coupled to reverse weathering in basalt alteration. And that is accompanied by a very large fractionation. That's a system dominated by advection. You can express something very close to the intrinsic isotopic fractionation in this process. Um, in contrast, you can have lithium forming in sediments, 
And especially if you have rapid clay formation in marine sediments, that process is accompanied by a very small isotopic fractionation. So an effective fractionation that is very different than your intrinsic fractionation. So if we have rapid rates of reverse weathering in the marine sediment pile, which is what I was modeling, we would expect seawater to have a much lower lithium isotope value. Does anybody have questions on that? Because the next couple slides won't be as much fun if you're not fully on board with this slide. I'm going to take that as total comprehension and acceptance of everything I said. <laughs> All right. So we can, um, one of the nice things about nice isotope systems is you, of course, translate this into a quantitative isotope mass balance as well. Um, so what we've done here is we're looking at the fractionation that occurs with lithium removal from something close to the intrinsic fractionation to something that's very muted um, with the lithium isotope value coming in from river waters contoured with the lithium isotope composition of seawater. And the only way to get very low lithium isotope values is to have a very small fractionation during lithium removal in the marine realm. Okay? So my student, Boriana um, calderon Asiel has been doing over the last couple of years is putting together a, a lithium isotope record from carbonates through Earth's history. Um, so carbonates have been shown in multiple studies through the Cenozoic and deeper in time to robustly track the lithium isotope value of seawater. Um, so we're looking at time is moving from 3 billion years here into the modern, looking at lithium isotope values. And for the vast majority of Earth's history, we have these very low lithium isotope values in contrast to the values that we see later in Earth's history. Okay? And in case you don't believe me that there's a difference in the mean values between these and this period, pre and post 445 million years ago, these are the bootstrap resampled means of the lithium isotope values. Okay. So one of the things that's um, half the battle of, of doing work in deep time is generating an interesting record. The other half of the battle is really convincing yourself that you're looking at a record that is telling you something actually about paleoenvironmental interpretation. Right? So uh, there's a couple ways in which you can do this. One is that you can look for coherent stratigraphic trends. Um, and importantly, when you see a time period, um, this is uh, these rocks right here, um, where you see scatter in any one time interval, what that actually commonly is is something where you have coherent stratigraphic trends. Um, this is the copper cap formation from um, this is deposited right before the uh, snowball earth events in the Neoproterozoic from, from Northwest Canada. This is work that was done by, um, with Peter Crockford. Um, so there are coherent stratigraphic trends in the lithium isotope record. That supports we're actually tracking primary environmental signals. One of the other things that's an essential part of working on rocks as well is having a petrographic context. Um, so for in all of these rocks, um, we have a petrographic context for them. Um, and including traditional petrography and cathaluminescence petrographic work. Um, and what we're looking for basically in this is that um, through both standard petrography and through cathaluminescence, you can pick out things where you have primary carbonate features indicating limited recrystallization. And you can also pick out things where you have evidence for obvious fluid-rich alteration. You can avoid things where you have obvious alteration and sample from intervals that have beautifully preserved petrographic textures. Okay. And importantly, um, as well, is where people have looked at carbonates that they know are altered. This is an example from, from Ullman, from chemical geology, looking at a belemite. Um, where you have obvious alteration, it seems like you're pushing to more heavy lithium isotope values in your carbonate, which makes sense. You're preferentially moving light lithium isotope values in fluid-rich alteration. So if you're saying that um, fluid-rich alteration is likely to give you to heavy values, that's very unlikely to give you this trend through time. That would be saying that the deeper time record is better preserved than, say, the Mesozoic and Cenozoic record, which is, of course, very unlikely. Okay. So what I think this lithium isotope record tells us um, is that we're seeing significant changes in lithium. And given the framework that I introduced to you, these low lithium isotope values 
this difference in mean lithium isotope values must be tied to a fundamental shift in how we remove lithium from the oceans, how reverse weathering happens. So we can say a little bit more than that, though. We can couple this actually to a diagenetic model um, where we can say something about the actual rates of this process. So to be able to mute the fractionation significantly, we need to have the rates of reverse weathering that occur at reasonably high dissolved silica concentrations. And of course, as introduced to you in many slides previously, the rates of reverse weathering will be increasing as you move from low silica concentrations into these higher silica concentrations. So you could also think of this as recording an increase in the rates of reverse weathering. Right? So this lithium isotope record, having values of seawater that are very low, is telling us, is providing a signal from the rock record for these very rapid rates of reverse weathering that we predicted from our model. Okay? All right, so in sum, um, how much, uh, who has the time? How much time do we have? Another 10 minutes? Okay, great. Only another 26 slides to get through. That's, not, that's great. I got, I got two laughs out of that joke, which is arguably a very low quality joke. Um, all right, so in sum, what I've hopefully convinced some of you of is uh, that reverse weathering could have sustained a warm Precambrian state. The reverse weathering could have been an important process controlling Earth's climatic evolution. Um, and what that means is that the, the radiation of, of eukaryotes, this late biological innovation, um, silica biomineralization fundamentally changed the way climate is regulated on Earth. Um, and lastly, is that this isn't something that we can only model. I think we have also empirical support for this, this transition. And importantly, as I've talked to you about um, some of you, for instance, we, don't, we, we should be able to predict this from other systems as well. This isn't something you should only be able to test with lithium. We should be able to, for instance, test this with potassium isotopes. Potassium isotopes you could apply the same framework to. So I think we have compelling evidence from the rock record that this process, these modeling conclusions are robust, but this is something that importantly we can continue to test and that we can continue to support. <clears throat> All right, so taking a step back, um, uh, you know, why, should, why should we care about this? Um, and especially for this crowd, what, is, what does this mean not only for, for Earth, but how we think about um, the habitability of, of terrestrial exoplanets in general? Um, so one of the things I think this supports is that this obviously doesn't make much of a difference if you're on the inner edge of the habitable zone. But if you're on the outer edge of the habitable zone, if you're in kind of the same condition that Mars was in, having reverse weathering gives you a much higher potential of being habitable, of being persistently habitable, than you would have where we just imagine a world with the silicate weathering feedback. Okay? This increases the potential to, to have, um, this also increases the potential to have sustained habitable lifespan of a planet for planets where you'll run out of, or where you'll have a decrease in outgassing before your planet is consumed by, um, well, before you, where you freeze to death instead of burning to death. Right? So I think this is something where we should be incorporating this into how we think about what planets will be habitable. One of the other things that's, I think, an interesting aspect for this is that um, this also fits with a, with a kind of anomalous observation that in the Precambrian Earth system, we basically have no evidence of ice or extreme ice ages, which is in strong contrast to what we have in the Phanerozoic, where, of course, we're vacillating between these ice house, greenhouse conditions on relatively short time scales. And that difference between vacillating ice house, greenhouse conditions and either stable conditions or catastrophic conditions is exactly what would be predicted if you had a more robust feedback, a more robust climate feedback, which the reverse weathering stabilizing feedback gives you. Okay. And lastly, um, I think these days it's, um, uh, it's, it's important to, to note that a lot of the science that we do, even if it's on topics that don't obviously have human implications, can end up benefiting 
human society. And that there is one of the values of blue sky science is that we don't know exactly where our measurements or where ideas will take us. Um, so one of, the, one of the things where reverse weathering took me is into studying urine. Um, I analyze a lot of urine uh, in my lab. So the methods that we set up to measure, to rapidly measure high cation concentration lithium isotope values in a, in a high throughput system are now being used in a, um, in a large medical study trying to get at where, um, where are the problems with uh, heart, or where are the problems with water balance or why we have catastrophic heart failure. So one of the things where lithium can be used is that you, you have uh, hypertension developing. You have problems with your water balance in your body, mostly because of kidneys malfunctioning. And it can either occur in the distal tubule or this proximal tubule, the, the loop of Henle, which some of you may remember from high school biology class. And in this loop of Henle, you reabsorb both sodium and lithium in contrast to this distal tubule. So looking at the, the lithium concentrations, beginning to look at the lithium isotope values of urine, we can have a sense of where people are developing resistance to water pills, which are the main way in which people are, um, or one of the main methods of treating people with hypertension. So I didn't expect you to actually take anything about kidneys and talk to about that a little longer than I expected. But the point of this is, is that I think this is an example and something where we can remember that even when you're studying something that seems um, like it won't have much societal relevance, like clay formation in the oceans, it can lead to something that has direct and obvious human implications. Um, and with that, I would like to thank my funding sources, foremost um, the NASA Astrobiology Institute and the Packard Foundation. And I would again like to thank my, um, the two students that really are the ones that did all of the work that, or all of the good parts of this talk, um, which are Terry Izan and Boriana calderon Asiel. I go back to the kidney slide for questions? <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, yeah. Um, whew, that's a tough one to repeat. Um, so we'll do my best to repeat that. So the, the Mars community, there's some disagreement where there is no carb, there is a dearth of carbonates, but there's a potential for high atmospheric CO2 concentrations. So the, the question in some ways is, do you think that reverse weathering could have been, clay formation could have been an important process on, early, on Mars, could have been something that played a key role in the carbonic acid system? Um, and yes, 100%. <laughs> um, so one of the things that kind of becomes tricky for this is that you have to imagine that Mars had large oceans. This works because th the way to think about this is basically think of, think of a planet as a bottle. You got a bunch of gas in the bottom part and then reverse weathering does is inject acid into that bottle. Right? You pop off the cap. Right? You increase, you redistribute carbon from the ocean up into the atmosphere. So it's, it's less important if you don't have an ocean. But if you buy the Mars scenarios where we have these massive oceans, um, or you buy the sedimentological evidence that suggests we had these massive oceans, you could have had this reverse weathering process giving you this fundamentally different type of climate regulation. But importantly, yeah, as well, it's just thinking about it of you have CO2, you have weathering, you don't have to form carbonates. You can just as easily, especially um, I think in mafic planets, uh, or planets where you have mostly um, uh, mafic end member rocks exposed rather than felsic rocks, you can imagine a system where it's just clay weathered to clay precipitated, and recycling of carbon within that, that system. Um, yeah. So great, great question. Your, and I should add, your question, for if anybody is actually tuning in, was much more well articulated than my reiteration of said question. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, people have been traditionally trying to measure it with quadrupole instruments. Um, oops, repeat the question. Um, how, how did you find yourself with so much urine in your lab? Um, <laughs> what was the question? Um, so it's, somebody, it's working with somebody from um, the Yale Medical School, um, and they were 
they were struggling to, to kind of get high precision measurements that were, that were basically accurate and that were affordable. Um, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't actually remember how, necessarily how we met, but um, just met because we're on the same campus and um, there's, there's kind of there's a easy ways to trans to do preliminary studies in different Yale centers of which, of my, which my lab is. Um, and then we put in a NIH grant and it um, got funded to kind of carry out and to do it on a much larger scale. Yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> so siliceous sponges obviously emer uh, evolved in the latest Precambrian or in the earliest Cambrian, but as a as a heterotroph, they just have less ca as a you know large animal, they have less capacity to be a major part of the biosphere as radiolarians and certainly as diatoms. So where we see the point of inflection occurs very close to where you start seeing an increase in the diversity of radiolarians and where importantly you lose a lot of the, at least in um, Andy, Andy Knoll's reconstruction of it, a lot of the abiogenic chirp precipitation. So I think the simplest model to propose would be that you have it evolving earlier, but radiolarians really take off during the Gobi or during the Ordovician diversification. And it's radiolarians that really have the much larger impact than siliceous sponges. Um, one of the things that I'd like to, to try to test is, or I'd like to be able to find a way to actually test that. Um, or potentially even to be able to test uh, um, if you had a shift in silica concentrations from the Cambrian into the Ordovician, which people have done for the Cenozoic by looking at the isotopic difference in silica between radiolarians and siliceous sponges, one being dependent on the concentration and one not. Uh, yeah, um, the, the question was, uh, do you think that in the Cenozoic, there is a corresponding change in the lithium isotope values that reflects a second drop in silica concentration? Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's, well, the lithium isotope definitely, the lithium isotope values definitely change around the time when you have diatoms becoming more important. One of the things that is, is interesting about that is that we don't see from this, this uh, silicon isotope method of reconstructing dissolved silicon concentrations, evidence for a significant shift in silica concentrations. Um, but you should at least have a spatial redistribution of your, of your flux of, of radiolarians being more isolated than diatoms, which are basically everywhere. So it's, I think it's a, a way where you could have the lithium isotope values reflecting this change in, in reverse weathering in sediment reverse weathering. And that would give you a means to have Cenozoic cooling, importantly as well, which is of course something that has been endlessly, endlessly debated. Yeah, great question. Even though that was a ramp, so the ramp, the short of that is maybe. <laughs> Let me get back to you in a couple years. <laughs> Yeah, um, so the, the group at Caltech that I was, oh, repeat the question, yes. Um, would this also have a, um, would this shift in the silica cycle also be reflected in the, in the, uh, in the evolution of the seawater record of silicon isotopes? Um, and yeah, that's something that the group at Caltech that I was working with, Woody Fisher um, and student Lizzie Trower have proposed. Um, one of the problems is that it's, uh, there's not, there's not a great record of how seawater silicon changed in the Precambrian. And one of the, what you'd be looking at is the difference between basically the fractionation in chert and the, different, and, and the, precipitation, and the di difference in isotopic values of chert that's being buried versus clay minerals that are being buried. And when people have looked at chert in the geologic record, interestingly, it seems to be very variable. So that extreme variability um, with some of the silica being shuttled into sediments with iron oxides and things like that may make it less pronounced, um, but it, has, it is something that has been proposed. 
tentatively. 